God is proposing something to me. And it might look like just dumb suffering as far as I'm concerned, but somehow in there, God is proposing to me, what? The possibility of love. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I am Brandon Vaught, the Senior Content Director here at Word on Fire. Joining me from Santa Barbara is Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always nice to talk to you. How you doing? How are the kids a lot doing? Of, oh, we're doing, we're doing very well. We were just good. talking about our little three-year-old Gilbert before the yeah. show. He you know, is in the two, three-year-old phase of <laughs> obstinacy, but um, yeah. he's, he's getting there. Good. We've got lots of good stuff to talk about today. We're going to focus on the issue of God's will. Why does God allow the things that he does in this world? We're going to learn about the difference between God's active will and God's passive will, and the unbelievable story of a Catholic priest who spent 23 years in Siberian prison camps and later reflected a lot on why God allowed that to happen to great um, spiritual edification. Before we get to that, though, how about a uh, few updates here, Bishop? You've had a lot going on even during this time of COVID. Um, You've had some exciting trips, some exciting conversations. Uh, I got a few here I wanted to get your feedback on. The first one is your recent trip to Dallas. Tell us how that went. Oh, yeah. You know, it was good. I I was there visiting our uh, office in Dallas, and um, a lot of these people I hadn't even met yet, people we've hired since I was last there. I was there precisely once before to bless the office, and since then it's really expanded. A lot of new people. So we got down there. The weather was pretty bad. It was, it was like Chicago, cold. But we spent you know, a good amount of time with the Word on Fire fellows and with all the support staff, so it was a great joy. And we just got out. So our plane left the day before the really bad storm came. And God help us, some of our poor people did lose the, you know, their um, uh, heating, electricity, and all that stuff. Um, so God bless them. Uh, but we got out just the day before all that happened. But it was a uh, uplifting trip for me to see these wonderful people that have, you know, dedicated their their life and time to uh, to Word on Fire. It's really encouraging that that hu- office is the hub of our Word on Fire Institute, yeah. and the institute's just exploding. I know a lot of listeners to this show are yeah. part of the Word on Fire Institute. If you're not, learn more. Join yeah. at wordonfire.institute. Um, but we have lots and lots of new fellows and teachers and staff members all supporting this great institution. So it's it's one of the most exciting initiatives uh, that Word on Fire has embarked upon. Mm-hmm. Also, Bishop, you got to spend some time in Dallas, I know, with our friend Jonathan Rumi, oh, yeah. who plays Jesus in right. the film Chosen. Uh, tell us about that. Well, it worked out pretty well. We were supposed to go down there to to the set and to watch some of the filming. So Jonathan had made these arrangements, and we had our COVID tests done and all that. You know, they were being real careful. Well, the day we were supposed to go, they called it off. It was The weather was too bad. But happily, Jonathan wrote and said, uh, hey, I, my sister is in town with me here. Could we come up to Dallas? They weren't that far away. And join you guys for dinner. So we said, yeah, sure. So we had a wonderful... It was nice. You know, in California, we can't go out for dinner. Everything's still shut down. In Dallas, they, they allow uh, restaurants to be open. So we had a wonderful evening with him and his sister, and he's just, a, he's a lot of fun and uh, also a very edifying guy. And you know what's interesting, Brandon? We're talking about Walter Chizek later. Is I happened to bring him up in a kind of oblique way, he was all over it. He said, oh yeah, I'm reading him. Like, man, there's something in the air right now with Walter Chizek, but we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, it was a great joy being with him. Also, you recently had a Big, long, I think it was nearly two-hour dialogue with Alex O'Connor. He might not be a household name in the Catholic world, but on the internet, especially on YouTube, he certainly is. He goes by the moniker Cosmic Skeptic. Mm -hmm. That's where you'll find him on YouTube and Twitter. He's kind of one of, if not the most prominent young atheists on the internet right now. Um, I think he's got close to 400,000 subscribers on YouTube, so he's a really big deal. And you sat down with him for a two-hour dialogue, not a formal debate, but a dialogue as a part of the Templeton-funded Big yeah. Conversation series. It was hosted by our friend Justin Brierley, who is behind the unbelievable podcast and series. Um, it's going to come out in April, so I think in about yeah. one month, and we'll be sure to share all the info here. But just what was your immediate takeaway from that conversation? Well, I enjoyed it. I had watched really at your prompting, Brandon, because I don't think I knew Alex even a couple of months ago, and then you told me about him. 
and I've watched a lot of his uh, videos and dialogues. And, you know, he's a super smart young guy. I think he's still an undergraduate at Oxford, so he's probably, what, 21 or two years old. Very smart, very articulate. Uh, former Catholic, you know, born and raised a Catholic, and then has become, as you say, a pretty militant uh, atheist. But, you know, I enjoyed talking to him. Um, you know, we, we went at it on a number of issues, and, you know, a few times things got, not never got heated, but, you know, we had a, you know, a, a sharp exchange on some things. But I enjoyed spending time with him. Uh, and then Justin, as you mentioned, was the, mo the moderator of the discussion. And he's very good. Justin is a believer, but his program, called Unbelievable, with a question mark, always has a believer and a non-believer, doesn't it, typically? And then they're in some kind of conversation. So uh, I enjoyed it. It lasted, you're right, a long time. It was about two hours. Um, but uh, for me, anyway, it went fast, and I hope people enjoy the conversation. So again, we'll share more details yeah. of that later, maybe even sharing the audio of the discussion here on the podcast. One more item. This one has been, I think, almost a year in the making, and we finally released it last week, and that is all of our video and audio reflections on the rosary. Um, right. You can learn more at wordonfire.org slash rosary. We have several videos. We have an introduction to the rosary, so what it is, why it matters. We have a short video on how to pray the rosary, if you've never done it before. And then we have four videos, one for each of the sets of mysteries of the rosary. And each one of those four longer videos includes the whole rosary. Bishop Barron prays the rosary. He reflects on each of the mysteries. But it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, an, it's a real prayerful experience because of the music and the gorgeous artwork that's uh, displayed on the screen. It's, I think, one of the most profound media projects we've released. Um, talk a little bit about the, the creation and, and the release of this rosary series. Yeah, I'm proud of it. I can't take a lot of credit. It's the team has been putting that together, including yourself, Brandon, of course. Uh, I recorded some, you know, the reflections and I recorded the praying of the rosary. Uh, I love the rosary prayer. It's a, it's a you know, staple of my own spiritual life. And whatever I can do to, to popularize that, to make it uh, more accessible for people, I want to. So I, I've been enthusiastic about this project, really grateful to the whole team. So many all over the country and our team have contributed to this. So super excited about it. I think, what, a couple days is going to come out from when we're recording? Yeah, uh, right. I think by the time this episode yeah, airs, it will be live. Okay, um, you can find it at wordonfire.org slash rosary, especially now during Lent. Maybe gather your family, get a friend or two, commit to praying. Yeah a full rosary each day or once a week, something like that, and, and use and share these videos and audios widely. You can find all the videos on YouTube. The audio versions are available on every podcasting service. So whatever you're listening to uh, the Word on Fire show on, you can find the rosary on there as well. So you can download it and listen on the go. Yeah. Okay, we made it through all the updates <laughs> and the announcements. So let's turn now to the topic of discussion. We, You and I have been wanting to talk about this for some time, this idea of abandonment to divine providence. Now, near the, the second part of this discussion, we'll, we'll focus specifically on this priest you mentioned earlier, Fa Father Walter Chisek, and uh, his experiences in his books. But at the beginning, let's just stick with the general spiritual principle, because it predates him by at least a couple hundred years. Um, there's a famous 18th century book by a priest named Father Jean-Pierre de Cossade titled Abandonment to Divine Providence. Maybe, for starters, tell us what this idea is. What is this spiritual principle all about? Well, it's a way of instantiating this great theological idea that God is not blandly indifferent to the world, let's say in the deist kind of understanding, that there is a God, but he's more or less indifferent. You find the same thing in some forms of classical philosophy. This is a much more biblical idea, that the God that we believe in is the creator of the universe, of course, but also is the sustainer and guider of the universe. So God is as Aquinas says, in all things, by essence, presence, and power. Well, what that looks like is what we call divine providence, that from all eternity, God has a plan. I think of uh, uh, one of my heroes, Bob Dylan, you know, I'm hanging in the balance of a perfect finished plan, like every sparrow fallen, like every grain of sand. That's a, a deeply biblical sense of here's this wide and complex world but in some sense, if I see it theologically, it's a perfect finished plan. It's something that God has had in mind that's unfolding according to his purpose. And our task, if you want, is to discern that will and then cooperate with it. 
So I, I would say it's a way of spiritually instantiating the idea of God's omnipresence in all things by essence, presence, and power. I think a key dimension of this spiritual principle is the recognition that everything that happens is God's will. And I know that principle can be misunderstood or abused. Um, I think the immediate objection people have to it is, okay, sorry, if everything is God's will, are you saying this horrible traumatic experience is part of God's will? You know, we're still in the middle of the COVID period. I know there's lots of people saying, is COVID really God's will? That's part of God's will for the world? Uh, How do you address these sorts of objections? Well, go back to Jean-Pierre de Cossard, whom you referenced. Um, He says, laconically enough, whatever happens, whatever is, is in some sense the will of God, either actively or permissively. So either God is actively desiring. I, I would say, for example, our existence. Aquinas would say God loves all things in the measure that he wills them some good. Right? He wills them at least the good of existence. So God loves a rock. God loves clouds. God loves whatever it is. So is that God's active will? Yeah, God is actively willing. The fact that you and I are here um, with, with these bodies, with our intelligence, with our capacity for speech, etc., yeah, that's God's active will. He's willed good to us. But is there also what Kosai would call, and following Aquinas and others, God's permissive will? So things that God allows to be, he's not directly willing them. God never directly wills evil, otherwise that would make him a sinner, right? But God, we say, permits certain evils so as to bring about a greater good. So therefore, Kosad concludes, whatever is, and that, yes, includes Hitler, and that includes suffering I'm going through now, that includes illness, that includes COVID, Whatever is, is in some sense, at least permissively, the will of God. And therefore, I am called upon, indeed, to surrender even to those things that, in, at least to my experience, are nothing but evil, but I surrender to them as at least an expression of God's permissive will. Whenever we get into the permissive will question, I'm reminded of our discussions on the problem of evil. You know, we we mentioned you just talked to Alex O'Connor, this famous atheist. He'll push really hard on the question of unexplained evils. Why did this poor infant suffer from cancer? Why did this deer get trapped in the forest and burned to death when nobody else is around? It serves no obvious good. And our answer to those cases is, look, we just don't know. We don't know the greater good that God wants to bring about. That doesn't mean there isn't one. It just means We don't know. And I think the same framework can be applied to the question of God's will. Why did God permit Hitler? Why did God permit COVID? Why is God willing these things? In some cases, all we can do is just say, I don't know, but I'm going to abandon myself to that will nonetheless. Yes, and cooperate with it, which we'll get to. And we'll also get to Walter Chizak. It's a very good example of someone who was going through horrific suffering in his own life, but consistently read it as somehow expressive of the divine will. Think of a Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, the great uh, Lutheran pastor, theologian, opponent to Hitler, who's one of the last people put to death in the Third Reich. He dies, I think, in either March or April of 1945, right before Hitler's own death. Think of Bonhoeffer in that prison, um, enduring this tremendous suffering, knowing he's going to die, and yet is in that prison as a man of faith accepting this as, in some sense, an expression of God's will. What's the good that will come of it? Well, Bonhoeffer probably, he didn't know. He couldn't see it uh, directly and specifically. But yet, look what's happened in the years since his death, the extraordinary fruit that his life and death have borne. Now, am I saying, oh, that explains it, got it figured out? No, but it's an indication. It's an indication of what might come even from what looks just like dumb suffering. But people of faith have a wider vision, right? We walk by faith and not by sight. That means we we don't see it clearly, but yet we have an intuition that God is about something. God's about something. And I have to trust in that, even when it seems nothing but dark to me. This concept of abandonment to divine providence can sound a lot like the Stoic principle of 
dispassionate acceptance mm -hmm. of the way that the world is. The Stoics will say, look, you can't control what happens to you. You can't control the world around you, but you can control how you respond to that. So that's all you should focus on. Don't worry about you know, changing or affecting major events around you, but focus on yourself. What's the, what's the difference between the Christian view of cooperating with and abandoning ourselves to providence versus the, the stoic acceptance of reality? Yeah, there's some overlap. And that's we talked earlier, I think, about stoicism. And there are certain points of overlap. And our own people have used stoic reflection sometimes to understand dimensions of the spiritual life. So I wouldn't want to say they're simply opposed. But I'd say the major difference, Brandon, is this. It's not simply a sort of a passive, detached acceptance, like, up, oh, you know, that's the way things are, and, and okay, I just I accept it. I would refer to our approach as a kind of active surrender. And I mean that, of course, paradoxically. In one way, yeah, I'm surrendering to God's will. So what's happening, I say, all right, is being proposed to me by the divine will for God's purpose. But what does God want? He doesn't want just dumb passivity. What he invites is an active engagement. Again, we'll get to Walter Cheesek. It's a really good example. He wants active engagement with it. So God is proposing something to me. And it might look like just dumb suffering as far as I'm concerned, but somehow in there, God is proposing to me, what? The possibility of love. The possibility of becoming an agent of grace in the world. So I now we say cooperate with the divine will. I don't just dumbly sit back. No, no, I'm actively called forth by the divine will to cooperate with it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his prison cell is cooperating with the divine will. Um, it doesn't look all the time like heroism. We might not really get what God is about, but we accept it actively. We surrender to it, but with an active spirit of cooperation. And it's, it's cool then to look at the lives of the saints to see what that looks like. So we're articulating it now in a kind of abstract way, but you see the saints, that's what it looks like. It seems to me that in Christianity, there's also a couple added dimensions that you don't get with something like Stoicism. One would be that this providence, this sovereign force that's arranging the world is not just some abstract force, that it's a person with agency yeah. that you can pray to and interact with. And so that adds a new dimension of cooperation that you wouldn't get on Stoicism. Um, but then also it seems to me that because God is, is a personal agent, he's able to change course and incorporate missteps in our own lives. Yeah. Um, to put on my, my Tolkien nerd hat, at the beginning of Tolkien's <laughs> Silmarillion, he tells this creation story where he has all the angels singing in harmony, this beautiful symphony. They're singing the world into existence, but then Melkor, the bad angel, intentionally sings off key because he wants to inject his own will. But then God, the Ilu Iluvatar, the God figure, takes Melkor's notes and weaves them yeah. into his song. He creates a new song around it to bring a new harmony. It seems like that's the Christian difference yeah. when it comes to cooperating with sovereignty. Right. And, you know, I've used that image before of the, uh, the Waze app on the phone, you know, that it's telling you where to go. And when you go your own way, you say, oh, no, I don't think that's right. I'm going to take my... And then you're almost always wrong. It doesn't punish you so much. It just it reconfigures that. It says, okay, you've taken a wrong turn, but now I'm going to show you how to get from there where you shouldn't have been in the first place, but I'll, I'll show you how to get from there to where you need to go. So, right, God, you know, writing straight with crooked lines, according to the overused cliche, but there's a lot to that. God finds a way. And, yeah, that's good. He takes even that errant note, but then makes it part of a new chord or a new harmony. Um, that's the way it works. All right, let's shift gears and focus on this extraordinary priest, Father Walter Chisek. We've mentioned his name a couple times. Um, he's written uh, two major books. The first one is titled With God in Russia. Hold it up there in the camera. I know, Bishop, you recently read this. And then the follow-up sequel is He Leadeth Me. Mm -hmm. Both of them um, follow similar events. They, they trace this two- to three-decade period of time when... Um, he was. Uh, he spent 23 years in Russian prison camps. He was an American. He was falsely imprisoned. They thought he was an American spy. 
And during these, these horrific experiences in these Russian camps, he was interrogated, he was tortured, he was isolated, he was sent to labor camps, forced to do backbreaking labor. Um, but throughout all this, he learned some really profound spiritual lessons that he shares in these books. Bishop, what, what was your first impression on reading With God in Russia? Well, you know, he was, this happens to me a lot, Brandon, and it's part of our theme of the divine providence, it, is he came on my radar screen in this really fresh way. I knew the name. I remember some students of mine at Mundelein uh, when I was there kind of got into Walter Chizik. And I remember one of them saying to me, hey, Father, uh, do you know about this Walter Cheesy? I'm like, no, I never heard of him. And then he told me a few of the stories, and I was like, oh, man, that's, that's really something. And, you know, it, it, it didn't sink in. And honestly, Brandon, I forget why, but he came on my radar screen recently. And I, I wrote to you and said, hey, could you uh, order for me, you know, these books by Walter Cheesy? So they came, and um, I'm, I'm still not quite through with, with God in Russia. It's a big book. It's about 400 pages. And boy, is it detailed. That guy have a memory uh, for, for details of his, of his travails. But it's a weirdly absorbing book because, as you say, American Jesuit followed the uh, inspiration of, of Pope Pius XI, who said, you know, I'm really worried about my, my brothers and sisters behind uh, the Russian border who are now without ministry and so on. And for whatever reason, this young kid, this young Jesuit novice, I think at the time, said, I'll go, I'll go. He just, he knew that's where I'm supposed to go. So he studies at the so-called Russicum in Rome, which is like a seminary to train people in the Russian language and liturgy. Finds his way eventually to Poland. He couldn't get into Russia right away, but then by hook and by crook, he gets his way into Russia, where pretty quickly, it's right at the time when the war is breaking out, the, you know, the 1939, 1940, and the Nazis, and the, the whole mess. He finds himself uh, a prisoner. And they were so suspicious of this figure. You know, who is this guy and where's he coming from? And, and as you say, they accused him of being a spy. Spends uh, five years in this awful prison in Moscow, mostly in solitary confinement, and then interrogated like for you know, all night long. When that ordeal finally ends, they, they condemn him. So they, they say, no, no, you're, you're a spy. And they condemn him to, I think it was 15 years of hard labor. Then off he goes to Siberia. And don't read this book if you're cold, <laughs> because it's such a grim account of, it's so vividly told of what it was like to live in these awful barracks and, and to work like 15-hour days in the worst conditions, sleeping maybe a few freezing cold hours at night before you wake up again, on and on, on and on, on and on. It's like, it, it's, it's very, it's powerful in a way because it, it produces in you the feeling of what it was like to be under those conditions. Um, and yet through it all, and that comes out in that second book you referenced, what? He leadeth he me. He leadeth me. Somehow, and people around him falling into despair, committing suicide, you know, trying to escape from the camp just so they would get shot. I mean, the people that were so desperate. Nevertheless, this priest who was formed in the great spirituality of Ignatius, he leadeth me. Somehow the will of God, the will of God is being expressed. And that's the phrase that comes back over and over again as he tells the story. He leadeth me is a better place to start, I would say, because he'll give you like a quicker version of the details, but then he cuts to the spiritual chase, you know. The first book is, boy, you get a lot of detail. Um, but the, I would say read He Leadeth Me first, because through all of this, from, from Moscow to, to Siberia on trains, forced marches, torture, cold, starvation. He leadeth me. Somehow God is displaying to him his will and calling forth a loving cooperation with it. He saw himself, as, he's a priest, and under the weirdest circumstances, you know, as a young man, he never envisioned that, I'm sure that his priesthood would unfold under these conditions. But clandestine masses, clandestine confession, knowing, knowing he'd be shot if they found him or he'd be tortured or something. He'd be informed upon. That happened a lot. Like he would reveal to someone he was a priest and then they would go right to the authorities and inform on him and then he was punished severely. Can you imagine putting up with this under the worst physical conditions for decades? 
But through all of it, he said, he leadeth me. He's leading me somehow. It's an extraordinarily powerful story. Um, and, and you want someone who lived it concretely? Read that book. I can't help but think that he embodies a lot of the abstract principles we've been discussing yeah. here. For example, he wasn't just passive in the face right. of all these bad things. He didn't just sit in the corner of his cell and say, well, this is what God wants for me, and I'm just going to sit here and take it. He was still resisting the Soviet pressure yeah. by going around and secretly celebrating sacraments or evangelizing or encouraging people. He was still cooperating with the circumstances around him instead of just sitting back and and just letting it beat him down. I think that's it's the perfect response, the perfect way to embody this abandonment. It's not a passive giving up. It's cooperating right. with the reality around you. Well, I'll give me a couple of examples. When he was in solitary confinement, this Lubyanka prison, it was right near Red Square. He said he could hear the bells of the Kremlin. Uh, and he thought, okay, I can hear the bells so I can structure my day like a Jesuit um, novitiate. I know when it's 6 o'clock, when it's noon. I can do the Angelus at those times. Um, he, of course, couldn't say Mass in those days. He couldn't get bread and wine, but he had memorized all the prayers of the Mass. So he would, he would pray the Mass to himself. In the afternoon, he would do three rosaries, like one in Polish, one in Russian, one in Latin, I think, to keep those languages alive, but also to keep the life of prayer going. And he said, well, okay, here I am. I'm in a, basically a monastic cell. I'm, in those days, he was all alone. But I've got bells, and I've got time, and I've got these prayers in my mind. So, okay, I'll live like a, like a monk. So he did. Five years. Five years like that. Then he sent on this horrific train trip to Siberia. But he said, it's in He Leadeth Me, very strongly, how, how joyful he was. Because he suddenly had people he could talk to again. There were people around him. He'd been isolated so long. So now, okay, I got people around me. And they were, let's be frank about it, some of the worst people in Russian society, because he was a political prisoner, but he was often with, you know, rapists, murderers, thieves, the worst criminals, low-life people, I mean, blaspheming constantly, uh, uh, no respect for him as a priest. But, okay, I, I'm with people, and so here's my chance to be apostolic, you know? Then he gets to the camp. H horrific. I won't begin to tell you how horrific these camps were, but, okay, there are people now that know I'm a priest, and they're not out to get me. They, they just want me to say Mass for them and hear their confessions. And, and I can bring the Lord now to this situation. He leadeth me. He's, he's offering me an opportunity to cooperate. So that's what he did, and that kept his sanity. You know an amazing thing? Uh, he lived to be 80. He died in 1984. He said in all his years in Russia, including Siberia, <laughs> in concentration camp, labor camps. He said he never got sick. He never even had a cold. <laughs> Amazing. I, mean, I think he was a tough guy, a tough little uh, Polish-American guy. But he also, he recognized it as God's grace to him, that he, he never got sick, and he just did what he had to do to survive. But then he was a, a minister of the gospel, too, under these terrible circumstances, because he felt God was leading him. I believe, I could be wrong about this, I believe his, the exploratory phase of his cause for canonization has been open. So yeah. they're looking into the possibility of him being recognized as a saint. So that should signal there's some special grace or charism that he was given to live this abandonment to providence in a heroic way. But for us ordinary people, Bishop, uh, what can we learn from someone like Father Chisek, what, what lessons can he give us in imitating his example? How do we better abandon ourselves to providence? Right. I mean, look, I'd canonize the guy tomorrow. If you're asking me, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, think, I think if anyone deserves to be canonized, it's Walter Chisek. But uh, what you do, Brandon, is you kind of extrapolate from his extraordinary, extreme circumstance to your own. So we all have good days and bad days. We all have struggles. We all have deep disappointments. We all experience injustice. Talk about a guy, you know, he's, he's there as a priest to serve God's people, and he's sent to a horrific prison camp for 20 years. I mean, talk about an injustice. So when you experience injustice in your own life, someone is, you know, that's just really false, and boy, they're, they're persecuting me, and it's not fair to me at all. Okay, true, true, but at least with his permissive will, 
God wills this. So what can I do with it? How can I take that injustice or that suffering or that lack of fairness and cooperate with it for God's purposes? You know, so take Walter Cheesek as an extreme example, but then apply it to your own life. We've all got our version of the Lubyanka prison, all got our version of the Siberian labor camp. It's whatever suffering we're, we're asked to endure. But again, don't just like, oh, I'm just passively enduring it. No, no, I'm, I got my antennae out, my spiritual antennae. I'm, I'm looking for what is God up to? What does he want? What's he inviting me to? What greater faith, hope, and love is he inviting me to exhibit? What apostolic opportunity is there? Think here of, of John Paul II, who, I don't know, he must have referenced Cheesek at some point, but, but he certainly would have totally understood and, and you know, um, been in line with it. But John Paul II always told people, oh, if you're sick, you're suffering, don't, don't miss the opportunity. That's an opportunity you've been given by God. Don't miss it. Don't, don't let that go by. That's, wow, great, great. And that's not some weird masochism. It's to say, no, I'm being given an opportunity to participate in the sufferings of, of Christ, to join those sufferings to his for the salvation of the world. Um, those are the lessons we can learn from Walter Cheesek. I remember in the months following my first reading of He Leadeth Me, I would see so many of those moments that I otherwise would have right. passed away where your plans are frustrated, things didn't go your way. And instead of seeing those as cases where God's will was frustrated, God really wanted me to do X, but then the plans fell through, it didn't happen. God's will was frustrated. I begin to see that, no, this, this is all part of God's will. It, you know, Going to that event that I was planning to go, yeah must not have been part of God's will if he didn't permit me to do it. It, it recolors all of the, the burdens and the unplanned inconveniences that happen in your life. You begin to see all of them under God's sovereignty now. Yeah, and that's the great theological idea, God's sovereignty. God is sovereignly reigning over all of creation, and not at a, at a deistic distance, but in all things by essence, presence, and power. Always, if you want, like reshuffling the deck to, to give us a new opportunity to deepen our relationship with him. Now you read the mystics, um, John of the Cross, you know, we'll say often at the beginning of the spiritual journey, we have a lot of consolations. There's a lot of positive feeling associated with it. But then God, almost invariably, John of the Cross says, will take that away. Because you're not meant to fall in love with the good feelings. You're meant to fall in love with God's will. I remember Thomas Merton, you know, he has these famous uh, talks he gave to the novices that are on tape. And Merton was not really a great teacher. He's kind of rambling all over the place. But I remember one time he's, there was a reference to the Bible to the arms of God, you know, being, being grasped by the arms of God. And Merton said, well, God doesn't have any arms, but he's got a will. <laughs> and, well, that's it. It's, it's to, to rest in the arms of God means to surrender to his will. You know, and that's it. That's Christian spirituality in a nutshell, is discern the divine will and then surrender to it in a cooperative way. Uh, the rest is a footnote. That's what Christian spirituality is all about. Well, it's time now for one of our questions from our listeners. If you have something that you'd like to ask Bishop Barron, you can record a question by visiting askbishopbarron.com. Today we have a question from Declan. He's a, a follower in England, and he mm wants to know what the world would look like if everyone did exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. Here's his question. Hello, Bishop Barron. My name's Declan James, and I live in England. My question is, if all of us were like Jesus, or at least a lot more virtuous than we are, wouldn't the world be really boring? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I like the question because the answer is no. I'd say au contraire. Evil is what's boring. Sin is boring. Even though like in a superficial way, oh, the movies are all about, you know, sinners, I suppose. Yeah, but give me a break. Sin is what's dull. Sin is what's uninteresting. Sin is what's repetitive and, and tiresome. Um, to be like Jesus, of course, doesn't mean that we all have to, you know, dress like him and do exactly what he did in 2,000 years ago in Palestine. It means to live a life of active cooperation with God's will. And that will look like, um, that'll look like a, a, a millions of different paths because each person is unique in the way that he or she cooperates. 
and no, the saints are the ones who are fun and interesting and, and provocative and colorful. Um, it, that's sort of a lie the culture tells us that, uh, you know, hey, hell will be full of all the kind of fun, cool people. No, the fun, cool people. They're, they're the boring people. They're the tiresome people. They're the bored people. Think of so many, uh, gosh, I, you know, cocktail parties or those sort of gatherings where they're filled with people who are bored with themselves, bored with life. No, no, what's exciting, uh, look at Mother Teresa, look at Walter Chizik, look at the saints. They're the ones who live exciting lives. So no, the, the more we're like Jesus, the more colorful and rich and exciting the world becomes. That's why I've always loved the imagery of, of heaven as a city, right? Because a city is lively, full of people, lots of activities, and there's sports, and there's business, and there's finance, and there's politics, and entertainment, all going on in a big city. Well, that's what we envision, right? The end of the Bible is the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy city, all of it lit up by, by God's presence. That's what the world would look like if we all imitate Jesus. Reminds me of this great line from C.S. Lewis. He says, how monotonously alike yeah. are all the great tyrants and conquerors. <laughs> right. How gloriously different are the saints. Yeah, so quite like, right. Hit- Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, these guys are all the same. I mean, they're not exciting death. and different, but right. look at Joan of Arc and Pierre Giorgio and Mother Teresa and Father Chisek. These guys are gloriously different. Right. No, that's quite right. Bore me to death with the, the great evil figures. That's why, you know, Dante was so right, wasn't he? He doesn't have Milton's sense of the devil as this kind of, you know, romantic figure. The devil is this sad, stuck, uh, pathetic soul weeping from all six of his eyes. Pathetic, sad, depressed, bored. That's what evil looks like. Well, thanks for listening to this invigorating episode of the Word on Fire show. Uh, We encourage you to pick up one or both of Father Chisek's books. Um, The first one is called With God in Russia. As Bishop said, it's it's a bit longer. It's 300, 400 pages long. Probably the better entryway is his follow-up book, He Leadeth Me. He Leadeth Me also has less of the history and more of the spiritual analysis of the situation. So it'd be good reading during Lent. It's Mm -hmm. not too late to pick it up and read it. Um, during these last few weeks of of Lent. Also, I want to encourage you to listen to Bishop Barron's rosary prayers and pray the rosary along with us. You can do so at wordonfire.org slash rosary. You'll find separate videos for each of the sets of mysteries of the rosary, along with a couple short videos introducing the rosary and telling you how to pray it if it's your first time. Well, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.